Okay, well, welcome everyone to the first um, in this year's series of Sing Singapore Symposium Legal Theory Seminars. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, Zoe Sinnell to be our presenter, um, who will be speaking on uh, Just Feelings, A Tort Law Theory of Emotion, which I understand is the first or introductory chapter to your proposed book. Um, sorry, I'll just throw on my reading glasses to, to to say something about you, Zoe. Zoe is an associate professor and faculty scholar at the University of Western Ontario's Faculty of Law. She researches and teaches in private law and legal theory. She completed graduate and postgraduate work at Harvard, Toronto, and Oxford. And um, her principal research project, which she's going to present part of today, um, is on a book on the treatment of emotions in tort law um, entitled Just Feelings, a Tort Law Theory of Emotion. Uh, she's also the co-director of the Tort Law Research Group at Western and a co-author of Fridman's The Law of Torts in Canada and Introduction to the Canadian Law of Torts. Um, welcome, Zoe, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Jason. Thank you for that, 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 that really lovely introduction. Um, so I just want to thank you all for coming today and agreeing to sit through you know, yet another Zoom seminar. And as you know, my original visit was scheduled for February of 2020. So I really want to thank James Penner for his patience, his understanding, and his continued interest in having me participate in this seminar. I'm really excited to talk to you today about this project. So one thing the last two years have taught us is that there's no such thing as a long Zoom attention span. There just really isn't. So I will do my best to go on, not go on for too, too long. And so I, I really would like to hear your questions. And I will also, uh, just to keep people from being bored, I want to say a few things, some new things that aren't necessarily explicit in the chapter that I circulated. Uh, so what you have read is a draft of the first chapter of my book in progress, which is entitled, as James said, Just Feelings, A Tort Law Theory of Emotion. In the book, I look at specific doctrines that appear to treat emotions as bases for determinations of tort law's rights, duties, and remedies. I argue in each instance that something else is going on and that emotions understood as subjective feelings are actually irrelevant from the standpoint of tort law. Tort law, my argument goes, has its own conception of emotions, a conception that supports and constitutes an understanding of tort law's participants as related as free and equal persons under the law. The book project is actually in a fairly advanced stage, which means it's like probably 10 years from publication, uh, with many of the substantive draft chapters drafted or thought through. So to give you a better sense of how the chapter I circulated fits within this project, I want to spend the next few minutes or so sketching out the main cont contributions of each of these substantive chapters. In chapter two, I explore the role of fear in the tort of assault. So the tort of assault, the tort of assault the defendant intentionally creates in the mind of the plaintiff, the apprehension of harmful or offensive physical contact. Often this tort is conceptualized as a way of protecting the plaintiff's psychological interest and in being free from fear of undesired physical contact. But the doctrine is really clear that fear, understood as a subjective feeling of anxiety about one's physical safety, is irrelevant for an action in assault. So in my view, actually, assault is the archetypal um, Sorry, assault is the archetypal um, idea of wrong, right? So, uh, so it's an archetypal instance of coercion that is wrongful. The defendant wrongly asserts control over the person, the plaintiff, by imposing an external incentive that she has no right to impose. Through the exploration of the gist of assault, the book sets out and defends a particular conception of what I take to be rele the relevant understanding of an interpersonal wrong. So this understanding, I think, is well captured by Arthur Ripstein's colloquial formulation of you're not the boss of me. So the defendant's implicit or explicit claim in the tort of assault is that he is the boss of the plaintiff, that he has the authority to threaten the use of coercive force with respect to the plaintiff's physical body. So it is this wrongful assertion of authority that the tort of assault remedies, not the plaintiff's felt state of fear. In chapter three, I turn my attention to what appear to be the most obvious instances of tort law's recognition of emotional distress. These are the torts of intentional and negligent infliction of emotional distress, which I talk about a bit in the chapter you've, you, you've read. Um, here I argue in a more sustained way that it is not emotional disruption per se that is the object of compensation, but rather an injury to one's psychological integrity, broadly understood, as I argue, as one's uh, capacity to take up means to pursue ends. 
In the next chapter, I take up the question of what constitutes legal damage for torts that involve emotional setbacks. So this is where I explore particularly the justification for the common law rule that is established in Hinson Berry uh, that, quote, no damages are awarded for grief or sorrow caused by a person's death. So this is the focus on bereavement damages. So I look at these three possible ways in which the law can approach and compensate for grief. The first is as a standalone claim that is equivalent to negligent or intentional infliction of emotional harm, or mental harm. Secondly, as an indirect claim that is brought by the deceased's personal representative that is tied to the deceased's right not to be wrongfully killed. And thirdly, as a right against a third party from interfering with a particular kind of relationship that the bereaved had with the deceased. So I actually argue somewhat controversially in favor of this final alternative, according to which grief on its own is not sufficient for damages. That is, grief is not a legal injury, but that feelings of grief can be compensated as a type of consequential loss that flows what, from, from the wrongful deprivation of a certain kind of relationship. So this is actually just a side note. That was the chapter originally I was going to present in February 2020. So maybe you'll be relieved that that's not the one. So this is, this is a different one now. But so the next chapter, uh, chapter five, takes up more directly the question of whether tort damages can be awarded for the setbacks to emotional states that are the consequences of an actual wrong. So here I explore justifications for hedonic damages, uh, damages for pain and suffering, and aggravated damages. So these damages, it seems, appear to award compensation for negative emotional states, a plaintiff's loss of happiness post-accident, a plaintiff's feelings of physical and psychological pain, and a plaintiff's hurt feelings due to the way in which she was wronged. Significantly, these damages are award that are sorry, significantly that these, these are damages that are awarded for losses that themselves usually would not amount to standalone violations of a, a plaintiff's right. So these damages compensate for losses that flow from or are the consequences of an interior violation, such as the wrongful interference with someone's bodily integrity. So I explore in this chapter, and I'm actually not sure how this argument is going to go yet. This is the, probably the least explored chapter of the bunch. Uh, what, whether consequential losses of this sort, on um, the kind of theory that I'm putting forward, they have to amount themselves to deprivations of means in order to be legally salient. That is, so I have to argue in this in that way that damages for pain and suffering might not be permissible in tort law, I'm not sure I want to say that, uh, or whether they only have to amount to material setbacks to the plaintiff's interests. In chapter six, I shift my focus from claims involving the plaintiff's emotional state to issues concerning the, defend the defendant's emotional state. So I go from the plaintiff to the defendant, and here I look at questions, uh, here I look specifically at the question of the relevance of spite and malice for liability and nuisance, and also the unlawful means tort. And I also look at the relevance of spite and malice for damages such as punitive damages. So in line with the orthodox rule, I argue that malicious motive alone can't transform an otherwise rightful act into a wrong, and also that it cannot ground punishment in the form of punitive damages. But the cases, I think that there are cases though that treat spite as relevant and as salient, and I suggest that these should be interpreted as cases wherein if a court found no liability or a court only awarded compensatory damages, it would be tantamount to the court itself adopting the, spite, the, the defendant's spiteful maxim as its own public reason for its decision. In other words, the court would be grounding its legal decision in the spiteful maxim of the, of the defendant or somehow condoning it. In the book's final substantive chapter, chapter seven, I look at the place of regret in the law of torts, specifically the defendant's attitude towards his violation of an interpersonal norm and the consequences of this violation. Here I contend that regret has no role to play in private law's remedial responses to wrongs because the wrongs in private law are normatively inert. There is just no legal remainder or legal residue that regret can take as its object. Further, I argued that this relevance allows regret space to operate in our non-private law mediated private lives. Okay. So that's enough. That's what the book projects, the, 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 the chapters, the substantive chapters of the book that are focused more on the doctors of tort law. The chapter you actually have before you is not doctrinal in this way. It's my first attempt to draw out at a more general and abstract level, the types of arguments that I've used in the book's other chapters to interpret the common law of torts self-understanding of its own quote unquote emotional doctrines. 
So as a whole, the book is actually not an argument against tort law's recognition of emotional harm. As you can see from my above sketch of the chapters, the book's aim is much broader than this and it, exa- to, it wants to examine uh, the juridical relevance of other emotional states, not just the plaintiff's emotional distress. So the book invites us, I'm hoping, to ask what can we legally demand of one another with respect to our emotional interactions? What are the legal boundaries of our emotional claims against and to one another? So this project is in part a response to what I perceive as a sea change in our public discourse about the nature and power of individual feelings. According to the dominant narrative in recent law and emotion scholarship, moreover, this is how the story goes. They say that something like this, at one point emotions were excluded from the realm of public debate and reason. They are considered irrational, subjective, and like we can all sort of be honest here, something for women and children, not something for for rational men, okay? So about like 30 or 40 years ago, uh, this is this is, this is this, like the humanities uh, and social science scholarship took what we call known as an effective turn, and emotions were moved from the sidelines to the center. Right, emotions were reinterpreted as integral parts of rationality, not threats to it. The hard line between reason on the one hand and emotion on the other has now been all but been erased. Like, I think this is fine, like so far so good, right? So I don't see any problem with this better understanding of the nature of emotion as something integral rather than opposed to reason. And in fact, though, despite many law and emotion scholars citing this past reality in which reason and emotion were considered to be separate spheres, I've actually had a hard time finding any serious scholarship that says anything like that. Uh, But recent scholarship, but recent developments in relation to law and emotions do concern me. So here's what I'm concerned about. I have three concerns. First, I am worried. I am worried about the near absolute validity of individual feeling in popular discourse. I am concerned that subjective feelings are increasingly functioning as indisputable claims, not only of authenticity, but also that others behave in certain ways. Claims of the nature, I feel, therefore you ought, have become increasingly common in the public sphere, and I'm concerned that this ought might someday become the ought of legal obligation. So this is an obligation that is, that is backed by the coercive force of the state. So I have a second concern that's related to this and is even more dystopic, right? I'm worried about possible future attempts to control our emotional states through legal regulation. Here I'm thinking about situations of what the law might one day tell us we ought to feel a certain way or not feel a certain way and then attach legal consequences to these feelings or their absence. We're already seeing these kind of incursions in our lives of personal conscience in our employment settings I, 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 I've, I've experienced. So it's a short step away. Uh, third, I'm growing increasingly concerned about the uncritical acceptance of neuroscientific data as legally relevant and determinative. So I'll just take a recent example that was sent to me uh, by my associate dean. Uh, like, did we know about this? In fact, I did not know about this, but a leading personal injury law firm in in London, Ontario, has partnered with a faculty at my home institution. So this is the Brain and Mind Institute at Western, which is quite, considers itself quite famous, okay? And what they're doing is they're mapping the brain and and they wanna diagnose psychological changes that correspond to the phenomenon of post-traumatic stress disorder, so PTSD. So the idea, this this is the idea that we can see into people's brains and thus, and this is a quote from the press release, quote, show objectively if there is damage. This is troubling to me. So for the purposes of tort law, I argue that damage is a legal concept, not a scientific one. And it is a concept for judges and jurors to determine, not for neuroscientists and fMRI fMRI technicians to diagnose. So my my project responds to these worries in two ways. First, it offers a defense of tort law's orthodox treatment of emotional states as largely irrelevant for the purposes of liability and remedies. So that's the orthodox position in tort law, which I try to offer new arguments uh, to defend. Second, I try through the book to uncover what tort law's own conception of emotion is. And I argue that this is a conception that is is one that treats tort law's participants as bearers of equal freedom. So 
That's the general motivation for the project and a rough outline of it. So in the time that we have left, I want to try to set up the problem that I uh, addressed in the paper in a slightly different way from how it is currently presented in this, in this circulated chapter. So see if, see if this is see if this works better. If not, you can say, go, go, go with version A, not version B. But, you know, why not try new things? Okay, so I would like now to invite you to participate in a thought experiment to tease out some of our intuitions about what kind of tort law we would want to have in a liberal democracy. So let's imagine that we are all we are all tasked with designing this institution that we call tort law. And so we're told that it's a legal institution, right? That means that it exercises coercive powers that are backed by the state. And we're told that it's an institution that's concerned with resolving and redressing interpersonal disputes. So it's disputes between two private persons about the existence and extent of our interpersonal obligations, that is, and these are obligations that are obligations that we have not voluntarily all undertaken. So involuntarily imposed obligations between persons. So imagine further, and so this is like all very Rawlsian, even though I'm, I'm not really, I'm not a Rawlsian, but you know, this is, this is kind of part, part of the air we all, we all can breathe, right? So imagine, so, for, so like Rawls as representatives in our original, in the original position, we have to make these design decisions behind a veil of ignorance. So this is to say we don't know certain kinds of facts about ourselves and about our place in society. So we don't know if we are rich or poor, risk-taking or risk-averse, physically strong or weak, attractive or unappealing, able-bodied or disabled, psychologically tough or sensitive, and most important, we do not know what our particular conception of the good is. So we don't know the kinds of things that we value and the kinds of ends that we would like to we would choose. So if we assume, as Rawls does, uh, that we are rationally self-interested, that is not affected or motivated by the concerns of others, either through altruism or through envy, then it follows that we would want to design an institution of tort law that on the one hand would minimally constrain our ability to choose our own ends and our ability to pursue these ends, but on the other would also restrict the ability of others to interfere with our pursuit of our own rationally self-chosen ends. So that is, in other words, we say, we would choose an institution that maximizes our individual freedom to pursue our respective self-chosen ends. That is consistent with the freedom of others to do the same. So I think we can agree, that it seems the tort law we would design must be consistent with this aim or constraint of equal freedom. We would not, in other words, want to risk designing a system of tort law. Remember, we're all rational here. Uh, want to risk designing a system of tort law that favors some individuals over others based on a particular characteristic or a chosen value, characteristics or chosen values that we have no way of knowing whether we endorse or have. So you can, th so you can think like I do, and depending on how I'm feeling that day that I wake up, but I do that 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 equal freedom is like the justification for all legal authority, right? That coercion without this justification is mere force. Or you could think like Rawls appears to that equal freedom is instrumentally valuable, right? Because it allows us the best possible means to achieve ver further valuable ends of our own choosing. I don't think anything I say in this paper, or I hope nothing I say in the paper or in the book should hinge on which direction you take the justificatory aim of this thought experiment to be. I'm trying to be more ecumenical in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the philosophy that, that um, motivates this project. But it does require, I do require uh, a minimal acceptance of the bedrock ideas of liberal democracy. So that's a, a sort of a minimal presumption there. So the question is what kind of institution of tort law, what kind of, what kind of institution must tort law be to respect our equal freedom in this way? How should we settle interpersonal disputes about non-voluntarily assumed obligations such that no person is able to use the coercive authority of the state to impose his unilateral will on another? So from this idea of designing a just institution of tort law, one which maximally safeguards or necessarily, necessarily, it's hard to say, necessarily constitutes the equal freedom of its participants, so I think the three core arguments of this introductory chapter can kind of be derived. So first, the, formula, the formal argument, right, regarding the necessity of correlativity for liability, the substantive argument that requires that actionable interferences be interferences with one's actual means, things one already happens to have, that is not one's hoped for ends. And most obviously the institutional argument that prohibits the exercise of legal coercive force 
that transforms a person into a means for another's end. So I just want to spend some time unpacking these three arguments a bit more, and then we'll see how they apply to the, the, to the, to the concept of emotion that, I, that I've, I've put out in, in the chapter. So first, one way in which we can fail to treat one another as equals in the way demanded by tort liability is to assign liability based on a characteristic that is one-sided. That is to take as relevant a feature that does not apply to both parties equally. This means that we would not design an institution that assigned liability on the basis of a consideration that applied to only one party. So for questions of liability and questions of remedy, the only considerations that it comply, only, only considerations that comply to two, both parties equally are considerations that it can apply, that these are the considerations that apply to the transaction that is between them. Right? So the only considerations that actually can apply to both parties equally are considerations that relate to the transaction between them. So let's put this point somewhat differently. Uh, we can say that the equality of tort law, the equality that tort law is concerned with, is an equality of relation through a transaction. So the equality of relation through a transaction, not an equality of comparison. So it does not take into account considerations that are comparative, right? It takes into account considerations that are correlative. So whether a party is nicer or taller or friendlier, braver, more attractive, richer, poorer, poorer, et cetera, these are all irrelevant. These are irrelevant with respect to determinations of liability and remedy in private law. And this is because these features of virtue and need are not intrinsically relational. So that means like, if I am brave, that does not mean you are necessarily cowardly, right? If I am full, this does not necessarily mean that you are hungry, right? By contrast, right, if I wrong you, you are necessarily wronged by me. So, and then I think I was hungry when I wrote this bit. So if I, I take your sandwich, I have gained a sandwich and you have lost a sandwich, right? But by, by, by my breach of the norm against lunchtime thievery, I have gained your sandwich and you have lost your sandwich. So the breach of the norm, the same norm is the basis for, your, for my gain and for your loss. So from this perspective, the position of one party can only be understood through the correlative position of the other. And then the reason, right, that entitles you to demand that I return your sandwich or maybe provide you some money to buy a, a new sandwich right, is the same reason that I should not have taken it in the first place. And this is just that it is your sandwich, not mine. So if tort law were to take into account unilateral considerations, it would treat the parties unequally. If I demand your sandwich on the basis of my comparatively greater hunger, or say that I have better taste buds and I'm better able to appreciate your sandwich than you, this is no different, formally speaking, right, from my demanding your sandwich because I think it is tastier than my own or because I enjoy collecting sandwiches. In all of these cases, I am basing my claim to your sandwich on a reason that refers only to me and to my particular circumstances, not to a reason that applies to us equally. And the reason that, the only reason that applies to us equally is the norm that governs our interaction and its breach. Okay. So that's the first argument from correlativity, and, and that's why we would choose it in a liberal democracy for tort law. So second, uh, for the institution of tort law to treat us as equals, right? the subject matter that the above norm of equality concerns, that is the entitlements that attract tort law's protection, must be of a certain sort. Tort law cannot protect unilateral aspects of our well-being because in doing so, it would threaten our presupposition that we all agree to, although I never asked for any agreement, I just assumed we all agreed, that our freedom should only be limited by the equivalent claim of freedom of another. This means that only material aspects or manifestations of this equal freedom are the objects of tort law's protection of its rights. A person's needs or desires and wants are not objects of freedom that can be protected by coercive force directed against another individual. It's because legally protected entitlements that are exigible against another person another person who is understood as one's formal equal must be externally ascertainable objects of choice, things out there, right? They must be things that are, we are actually capable of choosing, not just things that we desire 
wish or hope for because objects of desire are not objects of choice. This means that our particular ends cannot be the subject matter of tort laws entitlements because ends are the things we aim for, that is things we have yet to achieve and bring under the control of our wills. So human beings are equal in their freedom to pursue their conceptions of the good by setting means to self-chosen ends, provided that in doing so, right? And when they do this, when they set their means to their self-chosen ends, they don't wrongfully interfere with another human being's equal capacity for setting his means to his ends, right? So I'm free to use my body or my property for whatever purpose I choose to, or even no purpose at all, right? Insofar as I do not thereby interfere with your equal ability to do the same. If I were free to use my body for whatever purpose I wanted, right? And I chose to use it to hit you on the nose with my fist, then by my very action, I deny your equal freedom to use your body, that is in this case, your nose, for whatever purpose you so choose, like smelling roses, right? In breaking your nose, I assert a level of freedom that is not compatible, right? Not compatible with the equal recognition of yours. So if we were to treat one another as equals in this sense, the only constraints we can have on one another's behavior must be consistent. I cannot demand, demand that you sacrifice your capacity for purposeness so that I can exercise greater freedom and vice versa. There's another way of saying that the only limit we can place on the conduct of others is to limit their domination of us. In other words, I can constrain your actions when they wrongfully interfere with my ability to exercise my capacity to pursue and set, to set and pursue my own ends. So when you turn my capacity into a means for your pursuit of your ends, this is a wrong, and it is a wrong that I can demand the state correct on my behalf. So significantly, right, this is not an entitlement against others to guarantee my success in my purposive activities, to ensure that I achieve the ends that I set out to achieve, but it is an entitlement that others not wrongfully interfere with me or the means I take up to pursue these ends. So finally, when we are designing a system of tort law that is compatible with our status as agents possessed of equal freedom, the institution we design cannot tolerate the use of any one of us as a means to the end of another or for some public good at large. For a system of tort law, this entails inter alia that the determinations of liability and remedy must be made from a non-unilateral standpoint. So when judges determine disputes about the rights between private persons, not only could they not act for their own private purposes, right, this is the idea of judicial impartiality, right, but they also cannot ask, act for the private purposes of either the litigants before them. This is another way of saying that legal standards have to be objective, not subjective. I do not get to determine how things go for both of us, and neither do you. We need what's called like an impartial third to decide how things are between us. So a subjective standard, subjective standards, which instantiates the private purposes and ends of one of the parties, Right? So it means only objective standards could treat the parties as equal, but finding a general that is a non-particularized norm of equal treatment before the law. So these are sort of the three abstract lessons we can draw from this thought experiment about what kind of tort law we would want, what sort of things would fall out of that. And now I think we can apply these three lessons to our design thought experiment about how tort law should treat the emotions more particularly. So how, would, how should tort law treat the emotions given these, uh, these three features that fall out of our, our, uh, our subjects about what, what is right in a liberal democracy for, for a just institution. Okay. So we can see, we apply some emotions to see if tort law, if tort law adopted an understanding of emotions that viewed them as subjective feelings and protected them as such, we can see this would be inimical to tort law's constitution of its agents as free and equal persons. So first, an emotional state in which is in one person does not correlate to the triggering of that emotional state by another. So you might respond that they are correlative in the sense that the emotional upsetter, right, is the creator of the emotional upsetees upset, just like the physical batterer is the cause of the batteries physical injury. I realize I've just made up a bunch of words there, but that's that's how it goes. That's, English is great. But to say this, but, but to say this, I think, to say this is correlative, mis actually misunderstands the correlativity that's correlativity that's involved in battery. It is not the fact of injury, the fact of physical harm, that makes the battery correlative. It has nothing to do with the objective reality of the interaction, right? 
It's not about it being in my body versus being in my head, right? But it's rather it's the identity of the phenomenon for its actor and its sufferer. So this is an identity that I'm going to say that is lacking in the case of the infliction of emotional suffering. So furthermore, what makes tort laws wrong battery correlative is the breach of a norm against non-consensual physical touching. The boundary set by this norm is a physical boundary in the way that the boundary of emotional wrongdoing cannot be. So this is why this is one of the reasons I rely on Lisa Feldman Barrett because her team has done these great meta analyses of hundreds of prominent neuroscientific studies. So I don't not neuroscientist, so I don't have the the, the, the background to this, nor do I have the top, the team of three hundred researchers. Like, right, but they and they read thousands of, of studies. Anyway, they persuasively I think reveal that emotions, despite what some of these studies have said are actually just not physical states in the brain. That there's no consistent fingerprint of any particular emotion in our gray matter, right? So this is what there's, that's what her kind of, her, her insight, I think really important insight is. Uh, but even let's say, let's say that even like fine, say emotions do map onto physical brain states, right? This does not mean that when someone makes them light up, so to speak, right? They have crossed a boundary of rightful amount emotional touching. So this is because legal boundaries are actually, right, constituted by considerations of interpersonal reasonableness, right? Reasonableness imports questions of what kinds of expectations we can and should have of one another as we live our lives in a world with others who are like us. And these expectations must be reciprocally consistent. I cannot demand more of you than you demand of me and vice versa. So the boundary with respect to physical touching, what constitutes unreasonable physical touching, is set by our acceptance, express or implied, of another's physical touch, All right? So we either accept it or we don't. There's actually a lot of disagreement about what 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 the boundary and battery is, in fact. But uh, so, but but we'll, we'll, we can we can move on. But by contrast, right, the boundary of emotional touching cannot be set by consent, expressed or implied in that way, and must be delineated differently. This is to say that it is unreasonable to assert a right not to be touched emotionally. To do so would be inconsistent with our basic humanity. A world, right, in which we are not free from physical contact without our consent is an unimaginable one. That is a world in which people could touch us without our consent and that be okay. That's not a world that we can really imagine. But I think equally unimaginable is a world in which we are entitled to be free from emotional contact without our consent. So we can say, no, no, you cannot touch me emotionally. I don't consent. The types of beings we are, right, and the types of culture that we have, right, we're social beings, with rich cultural lives, necessitates spontaneous and occasionally even unwanted social and emotional contact. So the intention to affect another person emotionally and the capacity to be affected by another are part of what it means to be human, part of like the give and take of our everyday lives. So to forego emotional contact, I would say, is to forego humanity. So the boundaries of what is considered unreasonable and unwanted emotional contact will be different from the boundaries of what is considered unreasonable and unwanted emotional contact. Sorry. So the boundaries of unreasonable and unwanted physical contact will be different from the boundaries of unreasonable and unwanted uh, emotional contact. Okay. So if we understand the symmetry, that is the correlativity or quality of tort law, as one made up of the wrongful transaction and its remedy, so the breach of the norm and its correction, then the relationship between the upsetter and the upset E, without something more, lacks the formal equality or the symmetry that is necessitated by a liberal, de liberal democratic institution of tort law. So in the chapter, I say something along the lines of the defendant's infliction, the plaintiff's suffering of mental harm are not correlative because they cannot be seen as the same experience looked at from different sides. And I base this sort of argument on uh, a leading neuroscientific understanding of emotions, that emotions are our own interpretations and predictions of the world, that they are created by us, they are within us. And that if we adopt the everyday understanding of emotions that sees them as feelings that are epistemically accessible only to the feeler, then again, emotions look as if they are in us, right? And thus they are not, they're asymmetrical reactions to various stimuli in the world. So I still think this is part of the story. But more and more, I'm thinking that the above argument I've outlined about correlativity, uh, which has to do with the nature of the phenomenon, the transaction itself, is, is rather than the kind of thing that emotion is, is the better way to, to articulate this, this concern. But I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, 
So the second constraint was sort of, that was the first constraint. This is the second constraint, uh, which has to do with the kinds of things that the norms of tort law can pick out as the basis for our ability to coerce another individual, right? These are things that have to be, uh, they're realizations in the world of our capacity for purposeness, right? As well as this capacity itself. So emotions, according to this argument, just aren't these sort of things. Emotional states are not means to further ends. They are ends themselves, often fleeting ends. So once, as I talk about like one's body and one's property, right? These are external aspects of the world that people can use to pursue the ends they choose for whatever reasons motivate them to choose these ends as opposed to others. Means are thus things that are available to us and for us to use in the world to achieve ultimate or even or intermediate goals. They are the capacity to set and pursue purposes, right? They are, they are not, by contrast, they are not aspects of our well-being. They are the ways, they are the means we use to achieve well-being. So without our body, right, we couldn't act in the world at all. And although this point is more contentious, I think it's arguable that at least it's arguable, but at least without the ability to possess material things maybe particular like property, like real property, we would not, we could also not set or pursue our purposes. Uh, so we might derive happiness or pleasure from our bodies or our property, but these hedonic aspects are irrelevant from the perspective of tort law. If I sue you for misappropriating something of mine, it doesn't matter whether I love that thing, never used it, didn't even know I had it, right? You wrong me regardless of how it features into considerations of my well-being. But emotions, right, emotions are not external objects of choice like property, nor are they the physical substance through which we effectuate our wills like our bodies. The reason for this is not just because, you know, against the Stoics conceptions, not because what the Stoics say, it's not because they are not under our control, right, but because they are not substances that can be used and put to use to achieve external ends. Emotional states are no doubt useful in a social sense, right? In fact, a lot of uh, neurobiologists and neuroscientists and evolutionary biologists have used that, played up to great effect how useful emotions have been for the evolution of human beings, right? These are all very depressing books I don't advise anyone read. Um, yet they are not states, right? They're not states that we can put to use, right? So you have a gym t-shirt that says no pain, no gain, but it's not the case that I'm using that pain for my like intense muscular gain, right? Right, I'm using a protein shake for that, right? I'm using my personal tra trainer that I paid for for that, okay? The pain is the byproduct of the gain, not a means to the end of the gain. So emotions are not means to achieve our ends. They are rather aspects of our well-being or ill-being as the case may be. Okay, so to see how this is so we can reflect on the difference between happiness on the one hand and money on the other, right? Happiness or pleasure are for many of us ultimate ends, not my particular ends to be honest, that's me. happiness is not, not an end, right? So actions are considered rational, right, to the extent that they are happy making and irrational to the extent that they are not, right? But remember, like what is considered to be happy making or pleasurable is intimately tied to the particular desires and makeup and beliefs of the individual chooser, right? So I might really enjoy a good scotch at the end of the day, but to you, if you are like my spouse, right, you would think that this is like throat burning, toxic, like sludge, right? Right. So you might enjoy things that I cannot cannot fathom. Right. Like a like a, 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 a merry go ride round ride. Right. Like my daughter really loves to go round and round on a merry go round. But to me, I just it just makes me want to vomit. Right. So pleasure is relative. Right. But the, and the point is that happiness and other emotional states are multifarious and, re and relative. They are all these aspects of our well-being, what we perceive as to be good for us and the ends we choose. That's what they reflect. And this is because, right, this is because happiness is not a means to achieve an end, but rather is an end in itself. By contrast, right, so let's say money, right, money is a universal means. It is the same for all of us, unless we have an eccentric relationship to money, right? So either we, we would like to live a life of poverty in which we have a relationship to money that is eccentric in the way that we do not want it, right? Or I think I talked in the paper about a really uh, pivotal figure in my young development, Scrooge McDuck, 
who used to go for like swims in his money bin and just had this pathological relationship to money, right? Okay, treated it as a fetish, right? Not, not as a means to an end, but as an end in itself. Okay. But for most of us, money is considered the means through which we pursue all of our ends. We can pursue it. So, find the, so last thing, so let's return to our final restriction on what an institution of tort law should look like in a liberal democracy. And this is uh, that it can't conforce any, any particular conception of the good. Right? This means that it cannot use the participants, the plaintiff and the defendant, right, before it as means to the good of either one of them or some other unspecified good. So this translates into the requirement that standards adopted of tort law have to be objective, not subjective. If tort law were to treat as salient one of the participants' emotional states, this would amount to the law's adoption of a private or subjective purpose. And if this were the case, right, if it were the case that defendants were legally responsible to promote and ensure the well-being of their plaintiffs, that plaintiffs had an entitlement against the defendants to ensure their happiness, then when a court ordered a defendant to pay damage to the plaintiff on this basis, the court would be forcing the defendant to pay for the plaintiff's particular conception of the good, whatever is happy making for the plaintiff. So a further question that is raised by this, this third argument, about whether a particular emotional state can be the subject of legal attention um, is, is whether, this, whether we can actually mandate a particular emotional state. Of course, my, my answer is that it cannot. First, because any such law would necessarily be ineffective, right? If we are hoping for an authentic emotional state, sort of self-defeating to say, you must feel this way. That doesn't work that way. Um, and second, because in so doing, the law I think would significantly restrict the space where these authentic emotional reactions operate. So these, these comments are more suggestive than the rest of the paper, but uh, I think that I, they ring true to me. So the, the object of legal authority is necessarily an action of a person. Your thoughts, beliefs, wishes, desires, and motives are irrelevant from the standpoint of the law unless and until they're unequivocally made manifest in an external act. So this is so for two reasons. First, um, internal mental states cannot affect the rights of others, that is, they cannot affect either their capacity for purposeness or the external objects of choice that they have taken up to pursue their purposes. So I can lie awake every night praying for, perhaps even planning out in detailed fashion, right, someone else's death, right? But until and unless my, like, these dark desires of mine manifest themselves unequivocally in an action that sets about to achieve this end, the law cannot touch me. Right, you're telling someone, stop thinking those things about me. That's not gonna happen, right? Uh, second, external coercion of an internal state poses some serious difficulties, uh, practical and conceptual, I think. But so let's imagine this might may or may not be a true story and I'm hoping my children can't overhear this, but one of my children uh, begins to use her sibling's toothbrush to brush her own teeth every night. And she does this just because she's a stinker. You know, she's not because she doesn't have her own toothbrush. It's not because she likes her sister's toothbrush more. And I discover this transgression, don't ask me how. And I order her on threat of giving away all of her beloved toys to stop this behavior. Or, I, or and I tell her, you have to buy your sister a new toothbrush, you have to apologize, and you better feel bad about it, feel contrite. So out of fear of being dispossessed of the material objects that she loves so dearly, and because she knows that I will follow through, she never again uses her sister's tooth toothbrush, right? She buys her a replacement and she apologizes. But we can see, we can see, like, it's obvious, she can't comply with my final order of enforced contrition. That's just not possible, because she's a stinker. She actually just doesn't feel bad about it. In fact, every night she lies awake giggling about how she used her sister's toothbrush for a month, right? So her reparative actions, even her apology performed out of fear of an external sanction, not from an internal motivation of regret or remorse. Now imagine the same situation, but imagine I am a better parent. That's hard to imagine, right? And give her, a, and I give her this quick, but somehow like effective lesson on Kantian ethics. I'm gonna say, as a parent, this never goes well. You try it, it just doesn't, just like kids, kids and Kant don't mix, okay? So she realizes her wrong. She takes reparative steps. She makes the apology. And she, without, without threatening, my threatening any external sanction, should she not comply? And here we would say that she's acted from her own free will and she's fulfilled her moral duty and experience its concomitant moral emotions. So when law steps in, this is like the suggestive thing which I talk about in my final chapter regret, but I think when law steps in and mandates an emotional reaction, we can see that it is not only counterproductive, 
but also potentially corrosive of the space in which interpersonal emotions can exist. So if I take these three arguments about the requirements of tort law and liberal democratic state together, we can see that emotions, if we understand them as subjective feelings, can all be the subject matter of tort. Emotions, as I argue in the chapter and elsewhere, are also not what several prominent neuroscientific accounts portray them as. That is, they portray them as either epiphenomenal states or physical states of the brain. So this physicalist picture of emotion, I argue, is flawed because such a reductivist account cannot hope to explain the true nature of a complex culturally and linguistically embedded concept such as emotion. Okay. But so what if though, and this is, this is the positive part of the book, which is why I'm gonna devote like one, 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 one full paragraph to it, right? But what if, what if the proper understanding of emotions is not that they are, is, is, is that they're not subjective feelings, right? They're not feelings in us in this way. What if tort law, right? What if tort law could evince a different understanding of emotions? So would this mean, if we could understand a tort law specific understanding of emotions, would this mean that emotions could be the proper province of tort law? And I answer, yeah, I say it's a qualified yes. So I wanna close with some remarks about the kinds of things emotions are according to a tort law picture of them, right? I think it's really important that law has its own concept of emotion, not one that we borrow from uh, philosophy or from science, right? So this is my, my, or psychology. So this is my tort law theory of emotion. Uh, so on this understanding, and it's emotions are correlative, right? They are connected to means and they are appropriate for law's attention, right? But this picture, this tort law picture, is not really how we think of emotions in our day-to-day -day lives or how neuroscience depicts them, right? Because from tort law's perspective, they are neither subjective experiences nor physical states, but rather they are objective legal constructs. So for emotion to be a private law legal concept, it must apply to both parties equally. And one way in which can do this is by invoking an objective reasonable person standard for emotional reactions. So this vein, we would ask something like, what would an appropriately emotionally constituted person feel in this person, in a particular situation? So this standard is objective with respect to emotional reactions. In the same way, I would say, the same way that negligence is standard of the reasonably prudent person is objective with respect to epistemic considerations of risk and whether a risk that one runs is a reasonable one. So the question of whether the emotional response is apt or inapt is not whether one truly experienced a particular emotion or not. So this I will suggest is tort law's construction of emotion. And it is something quite different from subjective feelings, subjective beliefs about one's feelings, or say patterns that light up on brain scans. So that's the positive bit of the book. And that's why I closed quite briefly on because it has yet to be developed more fully. So I look forward to all of your, your questions and all of your advice about how to, what, what to, how to continue with this project. And uh, so thank you very much for letting me speak to you today. I appreciate it.